All right. That was great. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, that was a good kickoff. And generally, um, please ask questions, right? Like the school is for you. And there is any question, please ask, right? If you don't understand anything, just interrupt. We can do this very, very informal. But like just generally, if you have questions, please raise your hand or make yourself heard and then um, ask a question. And um, I'm just going to kick it off a little bit to give you an idea about the questions we are interested in the lab. And I think these are generally very open questions in the field. And, um, and then we will go a little bit from there and cover, I think, for the first couple of lectures, a little bit of the basic biology we need to understand these questions. And for some of you, this will be a repetition. For some of you, this will be, will be, will be new. And what I would like to ask you, we're a very interdisciplinary crowd. And I think, you know, if there's biological problems, theorists or people don't understand, go talk to your peers, talk to me. We are all here. And if you don't understand anything and vice versa, right? Like when it gets a little bit more theoretical for the biologists, sometimes it can be hard to understand. Go talk to your friends, to, to your person next to you and just see, hey, look, I didn't understand this or come, come to us and try to understand, right? Like we are all here to learn and help each other. And so generally, I think... We all know that life fundamentally depends on the expenditure of energy, right? And if we, on the one hand, write it down, a fundamental of living systems is that they are metabolically active and open systems that through a constant exchange of energy and matter with their environment, keep themselves away from chemical equilibrium, right? So, and we all have to adhere um, to the second law of thermodynamics. So we all have to you know, increase the entropy of the universe. And to keep our, you know, we are all very ordered structures. The cell is a very ordered structures. We do information processing and all we have to do is to dissipate energy to the environment. And <clears throat> on the one hand, you know, life really needs to expend a lot of energy. And there's an interesting piece of trivia one can sh um, share and some of you may know it. And I, I heard that Pablo is doing this calculation a bit more intricate with you guys, but you can ask yourself a question is like, you know, on a per kilogram per kilogram basis, who expends more energy, right? Is it the sun or is it an average human being, right? And, you know, if you, if you read your nutritional requirements a day, right, we can do this calculation for a human, right? We all roughly need about 2000 kilocalories per day. And you can convert these units into joules and then into seconds, and that you can end up with a unit of watts, right? Like, so we all dissipate roughly about 100 watts to the environment in the form of heat. And if you now just make your calculation easy and say an average human is roughly about 100 kilograms, you arrive at a mass-specific dissipation in the form of heat to the environment about one watt per kilogram. And, you do, and when you do this and you go to the NASA and think about how much energy does the sun dissipate and how heavy the sun is, you can do the same calculation and you see that the sun on a per kilogram basis is orders of magnitude less powerful than an average human being. And this number is even higher for a bacterial cell, right? It's roughly about 100 watts or, um, per kilogram. So that tells you that there's something really, really remarkable about life that we need to dissipate, at least on a per kilogram basis, a lot of energy. Of course, the sun is massive. Right? And all life eventually depends on the energy. And you can do this if you now make an estimate how much cells there are in a human bodies, which arrives roughly about, and like a cellular um, power dissipation or heat dissipation or free energy dissipation about 100 watts per kilogram, like 100 picoweight. Um, and these questions we are asking now are not new questions because they have been asked ages ago, right? Like one of the first ones was actually Alfred Lotka. And I don't know if you know the name Lotka, but he is most famous for um, his model of predator and prey, and it's called the lotka von Terra model. But already in 1922, and he wrote two back-to-back -back papers thinking about can we look at the process of evolution 
from first principle and physical principle. And so he wrote these two single author back-to-back -back papers saying that if you translate his words, he would say the organism, which is, has the ability to capture most energy from the environment and dissipates the least amount of energy to the environment, will automatically prevail over length scales of evolution. A second person was actually a Nobel Prize winner of um, um, Ilya Prigogine, who um, um, got the Nobel Prize for dissipative structures in um, linear thermodynamics. And he thought that his framework of non-equilibrium thermodynamics should be applied or is applicable to a biological problem, specifically the problem of embryonic development. And um, what, if you now read Prigogine's um, theorem, he said in a stationary state, the production of entropy inside a thermodynamic system with constant external parameter is minimal and constant. And if the system is not in a stationary state, it will change until the entropy production rate, or in other words, the dissipative function of the system takes the smallest value. So meaning that there is a drive of systems to minimize their, their specific entropy production to the environment. And conceptually, this is really, really an interesting um, framework because there has been an interesting framework in biology, which is known as the Waddington epigenetic landscape. And that tells you a little bit what is the driving force of this, for example, of a stem cell differentiating into a muscle cell. And how does the underlying gene regulatory network does that? And how is it often depicted is a stem cell is somehow in a, in a, in a non, in a, in not in a stable state, and it's depicted by a pebble on top of a hill. And that pebble is then rolling down a valley, and the gravitational force driving that pebble down is, of course, how steep the valley is. And eventually it will end up in a minimal valley where there is you know, down at the bottom of the valley. And the valley is shaped by a gene regulatory network. And this has been, you know, this concept is really interesting because it is often depicted by an energy landscape and your stem cell or your differentiated cell is at one point in this stable state of minimal energetics. And it could be depicted in a way that, um, you know, what Prigogine said, that maybe biological systems try to minimize their, um, their energy um, dissipation. And if you now can think of that, you know, this, this trajectory of this pebble rolling down this valley is maybe developmental time, and maybe the, the gravitation, like the, 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 the height is the mass-specific entropy production. And this is super hand-wavy and completely speculative because Right now, I would say, and I think there is no general theory for the dynamics of complex far from equilibrium systems such as cells and embryos. And there is an cool, like a really interesting book from, from Antoine Kachalski. Um, he worked on problems of non-equilibrium thermodynamics already in the 70s, who sadly died in a terrorist at attack um, at the um, airport in Israel. Um, but he wrote that although there is no doubt that the formal approach of the thermodynamics of irreversible process is a powerful tool and one of the most promising approaches to the physical description of biological phenomena, there is much to be done before the all-embracing formula similar to the first and second laws will be formulated. And this, right now, I think this, this, this um, saying is really exciting because I think we're working on a very and Jonathan, yeah. I, I have a brief question actually. This um, to the point made by Prigogine. Yeah. Um, have there been attempts made to check this in any kind of. Uh... So there is, um, at, while we age, for example, right? Like we all, like you could see that aging is a slow decay to thermodynamic equilibrium. Right? And so what is very well known that your mass specific oxygen consumption or might, you know, as a human being or a lot of, like basically all animals which have looked, been looked at, is decreasing while we age. And that is, could be, 
could be related to that process, right? Um, then during development, people have done this in the 60s. And in the development, first it's opposite. Your mass specific oxygen consumption rapidly increases during development. And if we can get there, I can show you the data, maybe, maybe, maybe on, on Thursday. Um, and, but then it's slowly decreasing, but um, that is the systems dependent. So we do not know yet whether during development there's something similar. And the question is to what is oxygen related to the dissipative function is another question. But there is evidence for it, but also some against it. But basically, um, we in the lab, we, you know, there's some, I think I would argue some key questions first, like from the experimental side, as well as from the theoretical side, which we still do not understand quantitatively about um, the energetics and biological systems. And we work on the scales of embryos and cells. And there you could just ask, you know, how much energy and matter is actually consumed, conserved, and dissipated? So for example, if you think, can we quantitatively describe what does it cost in order to make a cell? And how much of that energy is conserved in your system and the biomass you make over time, how much is actually dissipated and there are two different costs. And on the other hand, how much more energy or like how much energy do you need first and then how much less energy do you need to maintain your out of equilibrium state? So for example, if you're not growing, just sitting out there and just growing your business and just maintaining yourself, like how much energy does that cost? And I think once we're able to understand this first from, from a theoretical as well as from an experimental side, and we can measure these quantities, and we then ask, you know, how is biologic, if biological constraint, is biology constrained by energy availability? Is it constrained by how is energy allocated towards all the complex um, um, cellular processes happening in a cell, or even on other time scales is, you know, how robust can a signaling system work or how robust can a cell function? Um, how fast can it does do a process? How, you know, during development, if you talk to a developmental biologist, everyone would say, yes, an organism gets more complex. But what does that mean even in, in these terms? Or like, you know, has been evolution, for example, constrained by flows. And that's on the scale of organisms and cells on very different time scales. But then you can also ask and start to look into the cell and think about if I now understand these quantities, for example, how are these energy and matter converted, right? Well, how does cellular metabolism really convert these flow, these nutrients into energy and matter the organism actually or the cell can actually use? And then how is that energy and matter allocated to all these different processes happening different in different space, in different, you know, different areas in a cell or in an organism or in different time scales? Right? Like how do you how do you budget? Um, your system. And these are the questions we are interested in from an experimental side, as well as um, together in collaboration with theorists. But what I would ask now you to tell me, what do we need and what do we need to know in order to build a cell? Any ideas? Yeah. The previous question. Previous, previous. So what do you mean by conversion between energy and matter? Um, so, for example, you conserve glucose, right? Like you consume glucose. Um, it has carbons, and I need these carbons to make biomass or something else. But it also has chemical bonds, which I can harness in order to gain energy. But that energy is not, I'm not just burning glucose. Well, I, I kind of do, but I do it stepwise in order to be able to harness it in energy currencies, for example, ATP, reducing equivalence, NADH. And there is a problem, right? At one point, I'm losing carbon as CO2, or I could have used that carbon to make mass. Right? So I need to allocate my, um, my resources I'm getting from the environment. Just a follow-up question. I think there's some people on Zoom as well, right? Doesn't work. Oh, no, no, it does work, right? Great. 
So when you say that uh, the, the body has a choice between CO2 and biomass, is it really a choice? Uh, isn't it stoichiometrically defined? Well, it is stoichiometrically defined, but at one point you can divert, right? Um, based, you know, you can divert your carbons or partially to make biomass or energy. And the question is, that's the idea, I think, um, um, a little bit about growth efficiencies. Can you, can you tune um, whether you make more or less biomass and dissipate more or less? All right, who can build me a cell? Anyone? What do I, what do I need to know? Beans, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. You have to have genes, so you produce like all your proteins you need, okay. and also organelles because you need to. It can be for the traffic, so just to produce ATP, so energy, yeah. and then I will say lipids to create compartments and to have a cell boundary, but uh, that's all I think. You would need transcription machinery and the associated proteins to okay. kind of regulate the gene structure. Who knows what a lipid is? Okay, about half. <laughs> Who knows what replication is? Okay, good. Transcription? All right. So we can probably go pretty fast, but um, basically what I want to use the first lecture and maybe the, the first two is to think a little bit about what cells are and what do we need to know in order to build a cell and then how much more do we need to know in order to build an organism, right? And I first, over the next, I think I have four, probably going to use three, to talk a little bit about cells and then basics and depending what Sunil is doing, a little, how much, depending on a little bit of bioenergetics and develop, uh, metabolism and then go a little bit into developmental biology and then eventually tell you how can we actually measure these quantities in living systems and what kind of approaches do we use. Um, and the first two probably going to be, for some of you who study biology, will be repetition. For some of you, maybe um, it will be new, but we can just go slowly through and just that we can get all on the same pace. Um, and the same pace. And so basically, um, in the lectures, what I used is the classical cell biology textbook, which is the molecular biology of the cell from Alberts. And then a lot of slides come from the physical biology of the cell by Rob Phillips and the cell biology by the numbers. And I used another developmental biology book, a famous one like Scott Gilbert. Um, but if we now look, you know, for example, if we look at E. coli, the classical model system for a prokaryotic cell, in, in, in biology, um, for example, this is a micrograph of E. coli and it has some, has some pili and, and it is an electron micrograph. And it's roughly about a micron in length. And this is what you can see here in E. coli colony, um, colonizing a, a, like a metal tip. And one can still ask, what do I need to know to build a cell is first of all, what is the elementary composition of a cell? Right? And if you just then look at the element and at the periodical system and see what are the most present elements in biology, what you can find is it's the 99 of the percent of elements are these elements here colored in red. So it's carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. And this is the CHNO, and then sometimes the next ones are um, phosphorus and sulfur, so it's kind of chops. Right? Like this is what you we need to remember. What is the elemental composition of a cell? Just say chops. And then you kind of know carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and so forth. And if you now then look at what is the elemental composition of the Earth's crust or the fraction in the ocean, and if you plot that as the fraction of the elements in a cell in a human body, you can see is that we have in the human body an overrepresentation of these elements compared to the elements present in the environment. 
And then you have elements, but that still doesn't make a cell. So at one point, we need molecules. Right? And these molecules, these elements are usually linked together via what we call a covalent bond. And these covalent bonds are roughly about 100 times stronger than the thermal energy available. And that's thus they are stable. And two molecules can also interact via um, non-covalent bonds, just like forming, for example, um, um, salt bridges and so on and so forth. And they are just much weaker and it can be broken much more easily. And then if you look, for example, you said you need lipids and organelles. And I was thinking even more basic is, you know, what are the building blocks of a cell? Right? Like you can say, what are the majority of molecules where my elements are organized in? And on one hand, we have sugars, right? Classical glucose sugars we all sometimes like to eat with cake and so on and so forth. We have fatty acids, which make up these lipids, which were mentioned before. We have amino acids, which make our proteins. And then we have nucleotides, which make up nucleic acids. And these building blocks also form larger units and cells, which, um, which I will get to in a minute, which is uh, macromolecule. But if we now think about what is a fatty acid, right? fatty acid is a long hydrocarbon chain. And the most prevalent fatty acid, I think, is C16, C18 palmitic acid in a cell. It has 16 carbons. Um, and then they have this carboxylic acid group on top, which that's hence a fatty acid. And they have a very, that's an amphiphilic molecule, right? Like you have a charged group up here, and then you have a very, very hydrophobic tail. That's the reason why it can also act as a, as a barrier. And these fatty acids organize into lipids, and that's the, the larger molecule. So you can have two fatty acids which are then coupled to a molecule called glycerol, and then you have a polar hat group. And that's the reason it's an amphiphatic molecule, which has a hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head. So they can form a, what do we call a membrane, like a lipid bilayer, where the hydrophobic tails interact with each other, and then the hydrophilic heads point towards to the charged molecules. Um, on the other hand, we have three uh, we have, you know, these, um, these subunits like sugars, amino acids, and nucleotides can be organized into macromolecules, building up what is most prevalent in a cell, known as polysaccharides, um, like a polypeptide or protein, and nucleic acids. Um, the carbohydrates or the sugars, um, for example, this is glucose, um, can be um, present in a, in a ring-like structure. Um, and that's the most prevalent carbon. And then you can condense these, um, these sugars into a polysaccharide. So for example, you can take two, two sugar molecules and then what we call in a chemical reaction called a condensing reaction, couple them to each other um, via a glycosidic bond. And you can also use and break them up again. Um, similarly, amino acids can form polypeptides and proteins. So if, for example, you have a classical amino acid group over here. So the reason why this molecule is called an amino acid is because you have an acid group on the one side called a, um, on an amino group on the other side. If you throw this into water at pH 7, this molecule is going to be a charged molecule, but the net charge is zero because you have a positively charged amino group and a negatively charged acid group. Um, and you can take two of those and form a peptide bond between those. And then you start to build up a polypeptide slowly. Um, similarly, we have nucleotides. So this is your classical famous molecule. It's an energy carrying molecule. It's called ATP or adenosine triphosphate. And it's built of a sugar called ribose, a base called adenine, and a triphosphate group on the side. And this is how the molecule looks like. And why is this an energy car um, carrier? Because this, this ester group between two phosphates carries um, quite a bit of energy when you hydrolyze it. And that energy is larger than any other phosphoester group out there. And somehow, during the course of evolution, 
these nucleotides, it doesn't have to be ATP, it could be also tiamine tree phosphate, has similar amount of energy, has been somehow been selected as the energy currency or one of the energy currencies. And how can you how can you get energy from this molecule? You can hydrolyze it using um, using water and split this um, phosphor uh, this, this this ester group and release about, like energy to um, which can be then used for the cell in order to work. How much and it um, and but besides um, being an energy currency. Of course, this is a building block of our nucleic acids in cells. And we have um, four different bases, A, T, C, um, A, T, G, and C, for DNA. And we can also build polymers or, um, or long molecules known as um, nucleic acids. If we just look at how big these molecules are, Right, if you think about you know, a phospholipid, a sugar, an amino acid, a nucleotide, or ATP, they're roughly on the scale of nanometers. And if we now look at the size scale um, of their polymers, you can see that the diameter of, for example, your DNA molecules are also on the order of about two nanometers, and the protein is roughly on the order of about 10 nanometers. And the lipid is roughly one nanometer. And most of your elements are not, um, in your cell are not in small little molecules, but actually roughly 90% of your mass is organized into macromolecules in a cell, such as DNA, RNA, protein, and lipids. And if we now look at what is the composition of macromolecules in cells, you can start to see 70% of a cell is actually water. And the dry mass of about 30% is roughly the majority of the dry mass is protein, followed by nucleic acids and saccharides. And then we have roughly about a few percent of small molecules, 4%. And the beauty is that you can also display this in, in this diagram to, to see the proportion of how much of your mass is actually protein, lipids, nucleotides, and small little metabolites. And beauty is that we have roughly, you know, a century of research, and so we could actually put numbers on, you know, how much protein there are actually, for example, in a cell of E. coli. And if we take an E. coli cell, which is roughly a micron or a femtoliter or a picogram in weight, and look as like how much numbers or like how much protein numbers do they actually have? And we can say, okay, an E. coli cell roughly has about 2 million proteins. And then, you know, roughly 20,000 ribosomes um, and so on and so forth. So you can really start to quantitatively build a census of the cell. And if we now, um, just go a little bit into the numerology. If we now look at these macromolecules like proteins um, and, and their size distribution, we can also not only look at their size distribution in terms of like how many nanometers they are, but what is the average length of a protein, for example, in a cell. And this you can actually measure. And you can see here, for example, this is for E. coli, this is for a yeast or for a human cell. And then you can see that the average length is roughly you know, 300 to 400 amino acids. So the polymer length of your average protein is roughly about 400. And of course, you can weigh this also by the abundance, right? Like you can not all the proteins, you do not only have, not all, all the proteins have 50 molecules in the cell, but some of them can have millions and the other can have one. And of course, you can weigh this by the distribution and you can see that, you know, at least in E. coli, the average protein roughly has about 200. Um, if we now do this across evolution and start to look at what is the average length of an amino acid in humans, in a fruit fly, Drosophila, in this, in this little worm, C. elegans, or even in, in a keel bacteria, 
you can see it's roughly pretty much conserved, same order of magnitude, the length of a protein. Roughly about 300 to 400 mean life. So if you, for example, want to say, you know, if I want to build a cell, how many proteins do I need to make? And how many, how many amino acids do I need to polymerize in order to make that cell? You first need to know, okay, what is, so you could, for example, think about, okay, my cell is about one picogram. I know 30% of that is dry weight, and I know 70% of that dry weight is protein, right? So I have an idea. And then I say, okay, this amount of protein I have, and I know how many amino acids per gram I have, and then you can start to calculate, you know, how many, how many um, amino acids do I need to polymerize? And if you then know how much energy it takes to polymerize one amino acid, then you can think about, I can start to arrive at a theoretical estimate about the growth cost to make protein in terms of the energetic. If we now also look at, you know, the, the composition of these macromolecules across evolution, you can see that it's also um, roughly conserved. Um, then if we um, think about what is the size of the DNA, which, or the DNA or the RNA, which made that protein, you can see that a protein is roughly about 5 nanometers to 10 nanometers. However, the RNA or the molecule which translated like which sequence got translated into that protein sequence, it's actually a much more floppy molecule swimming around. And we can also now just have a basic numerology about these macromolecules and cells. So for example, we can think about what is the average length of a base pair in your, in your molecule? What is the volume that base pair occupies? Um, for example, you can think about a DNA molecule also as a, as a polymer and it has a persistent length. Um, you can also, what is the radius of your average protein, your volume occupied, so on and so forth. There's all the vast knowledge of biochemistry we, we achieve. We can now start to put numbers on certain molecules. And these, I think, are important numbers if you want to understand or model or quantitatively um, do something. And, this is where these books are also very helpful. Um, for example, um, Rob Phillips's books on the physical biology of the cell or cell biology by the numbers. And there's also, I don't know, whoever, did any one of you use BioNumbers, the website BioNumbers? One, two, three, four, okay. So it's spreading, right? Like there's a website called BioNumbers. You can go and query it with, you know, how much ATP does it cost to make a cell, right? And then, gives you, it goes to the references where people have tried it. Or you can also ask, you know, what is the length of a protein? Or what is, um, you know, how much free energy do I get from ATP hydrolysis? And, you know, this is, is a massive database, very well curated. And if you ever look for numbers, bio numbers is one of the first numbers or like websites and databases you can, you can start querying. Um, but now, I told you 70% of a cell is water, but if you then actually look into the cell, and you know, it's a very, very, very crowded environment. So this is just like a hand drawing from an electron micrograph, and this is actually um, data from a molecular dynamic simulation, thinking about, thinking about the inside of the cell. And I don't know if, this, if the website movie is working, but yeah, exactly. So this is the molecular dynamic simulation of a piece of your cytoplasm of a cell. So it's not, it doesn't look like 70% water. Right? It's a very, very crowded environment. And this will be, we have to think about that a lot of the data we gather in biology is actually in dilute solution. But when you start to think about a cytoplasm that may work, but it's probably not the whole truth. Yeah, it's invisible, right? Exactly, but of course it's a lot of it's a lot of water, but and then, but still it's a very you know if you think about what is that three hundred milligrams per liter is the concentration of, um, that's a lot, milliliter. Right? Right. Yeah, the packing fraction is very high.
So you you do have this is like the the um, a shell of water around your proteins, right, making them solid. And there is um, there's a lot of effort right now. And I'm not an expert in the field, but this water behaves different from the other water when it's down to the protein shell. Um, it's the hydration shell of proteins, and it's really, you know, and it helps you to interact, right? Like, it's a charge. Your proteins are charged on the outside. And so if your protein is folding, you try to usually bury your hydrophobic amino acid interactions inside your protein and have the charged um, amino acids exposed to the outside. And this is, of course, then, you know, you form water bridges and with, with water and other molecules, and you can then displace the water to have a protein-protein interaction. Good. Um, another central part is heredity, right? I think why we're all here is heredity in a way, and we heard in order to build a cell earlier on, you need genes. And, you know, right now we can distinguish roughly 10 million, maybe even there are maybe even 100 million species on this planet Earth. And if we behave well, we might be able to conserve them or maybe not. But um, on the other hand, what, what I find remarkable is that each of these species is different and they all faithfully reproduce. And so they all have the ability to self-replicate. And then, of course, heredity um, is central to life. And we know that heredity information specifies, or like, you know, one can you know, interpret it in a way, specifies a system of complex chemical reactions that harnesses free energy from the environment. And if you think about an organism, right, like if you look at an oocyte or, you know, your germ cell giving rise to different species, right? Like if you sexually reproduce. And if you just look at them, they have roughly the same size, but over time make completely and vastly different organisms. And I find this remarkable, right? And um, we all know that, you know, heret the, the molecule which gave us the ability to do heredity is the DNA. And living systems store information um, in DNA and have been diversified over 3.5 billion years. And they store those in this molecule, double-stranded DNA, and it poly is a, made of a polymer, um, always of the same monomers as adenosine, cytosine, tiamine, and, and um, guanine. And of course, you know, we already saw what a nucleotide is, and you can then polymerize them into a strand um, of your monomers and form a word or a letter or even a sentence with these four letters. Um, chemically speaking, right, um, the polymerization is, you know, you take two, um, two um, nucleotides and then you hydrolyze actually an ATP or you take this, this two phosphates away to form a one phosphate bond between the two molecules. So on the one hand, you have used an ATP or two ATP equivalents because you have a pyrophosphate or two phosphate leaving it. So just, you know, if you, for example, want to know what is the energetic cost of replicating your genome, is you would usually say one base pair is roughly one pyrophosphate and the pyrophosphate is roughly two ATP equivalents. Um, and then, of course, this is a templated polymerization. So if you, if you want to copy your genome, or your gene, or your letters, or your sentences, you can use your letters and have a complementary um, letter. For example, G always pairs um, with C, and A always pairs with P. So you can use this as a template to make a polymer, like to copy your information. And then, of course, this is what we just had. It's like a tri, um, triphosphate nucleotide comes in, and you hydrolyze a pyrophosphate in order to polymerize or make your copy of your, of your polymer. And then there's DNA, you know, your double strand of DNA is then folding in what we know as this famous double helix. For example, if you just then crystallize this molecule of DNA and you look at, um, you look at um, the structural biology, you can nicely see this, this perfectly nicely double helix molecule. 
Um, of course, DNA is not just synthesized from scratch. It's always a, a solution. It's a, um, it's a template of polymerization. You always have complementary bases um, and twists around to form this double helix. And the process of replication or DNA replication is based on the templated polymerization underlying this copy and the information is actually in the letter sequence. And then you can just take a parental double helix and then form two new strands. And this is how then you have copied your DNA information. And then if you want to read out this information, you basically um, transcribe, this is what we call the, the cellular process of transcription, is you transcribe this information in your DNA in another polymer, another nucleate, nucleate acid called RNA or ribonucleic acid. The only difference between RNA and DNA is a hydroxyl group on your sugar. Um, and this RNA molecule is a single-stranded polymer and it uses a different sugar, what I just said, it, um, and it uses a uridine as a ladder instead of a T. And then the, the cellular process of translation is um, formatting or translating the information which you already transcribed from an inherited molecule, a replicated inherited molecule, into another molecule, and that's, of course, your protein, um, and where you polymerize your and this is known as the central dogma of biology. Right? And this is an original um, you know, copy of what Francis Crick, when Francis Crick um, postulated a central dogma, because at one point in, in history, proteins were the molecule. Right? Proteins did everything. And nobody thought, and everyone thought that proteins does the replication of RNA and DNA. But of course, it's the replication of the DNA given rise to the RNA, what we know today, and gives rise to protein. And this is what we know as the central dogma in biology. Um, this is just another depiction, a little bit more um, detailed, is that you have, of course, proteins which help you um, replicate your DNA, which is called DNA polymerases. You have a whole protein machinery replicating your DNA, and then you can transcribe this DNA using your RNA polymerase, making your single-stranded polymer called messenger RNA, and then you can read this out and translate them. Um, of course, um, RNAs are disposable, like in a way we can think about RNA as a disposable mass product of your DNA, and it's intermediate circuit messenger RNAs. And the machinery um, is a molecule called RNA polymerase, which transcribes, um, what it, what it transcribes your information in your DNA into RNA molecules. And similarly, if you think about its energetics, it also uses a triphosphate, this time an RNTP, not a DNTP. Um, and then you also hydrolyze a py pyrophosphate, which then gives you, again, these two ATP equivalents per base pair of RNA. Of course, RNA can fold um, and form 3D structures. And this RNA um, allows, for example, this folding of the RNA structure allows you to form a structure which, then, for example, can be bound by a protein, another RNA. And it's interesting that RNA itself can be a catalytical molecule. So it can actually catalyze chemical reactions. And there, um, is this hypothesis around that it was not first proteins, but it was actually first RNA, which gave rise to the first catalysis in the evolution of life. And then proteins start to come in and take over this catalysis role um, from RNA. Um, of course, um, proteins are now the majority of molecules, which does the catalysis or the, cat like the catalysis of chemical reactions in our cells. Um, they are long branched polymers, which then fold to each other. And we had this, right? Like normally you have your long polymer of amino acids, which then in the process of protein folding, form a 3D structure of your protein. And 
there you always try to bury your hydrophobic amino acids. You have 20 of them. They all have different chemical um, properties. And these 20 amino acids then, you know, once in a polypeptide, form an amino acid sequence, which then fold into your protein, which then can form a reactive site. For example, so a protein is usually is a reactive, uh, can be reactive or catalytic, right? It can catalyze a chemical reaction, but it can be also reactive in a way, binding another protein, making its function active or inactive. Um, and the process of translation or the protein synthesis is, of course, turning um, the four-letter alphabet of your, of your nucleotide sequence into a 20-letter alphabet of your protein sequence. And what is read out is this messenger RNA molecule, um, and it's always grouped in three codons. So usually, you know, three um, nucleotides um, give you one amino acid it's known as the genetic code. Um, you probably all at one point saw this massive diagram about what triplet codes, codes for what amino acid. And um, there's also a stop codon, and then this is read out by a molecule, another RNA molecule called tRNA which has, um, you know, like your anti-codon on one side, which then base pairs with this triplet um, codon letter, and that carries the respective amino acid, which then is polymerized by this massive RNA protein machinery in your cells called the ribosome. And the ribosome then um, reads out this mRNA together with tRNAs to form your polypeptide and your protein sequence. And um, also here, right, like if you think about, you know, the energetic costs of growth is we know that the amount of ribosome is a function of your growth rate. And you can also see that you need to form these peptide bonds here. And you also think about usually it's roughly four ATP equivalents per, um, per peptide bond formed, which is the, the energy invested into forming a polypeptide. Yeah. RNA can fold, yes, and can form 3D structures. Okay. Yeah. And then, for example, you can, for example, this is beautifully linear, but it, this is not, normally you can, you can have loops, what we call a stem loop, which then, for example, can be bound by another protein in order to tell the cell, look, make a lot of protein here or make no protein here. Um, you can have, um, for example, in bacterial cells, you can have structures which then self-cleave. So for example, you can have a structure forming, which is formed in, you know, when there's a certain metabolite, for example, let's say glucose, just as, a, as, a, as an example, glucose binds this RNA structure, it forms a 3D structure, which then somehow forms a catalytically site and self cleaves itself, so it degrades itself. So then you have the possibility for regulation, saying if there's a lot of glucose, I degrade my, my RNA, I don't have to make this enzyme, which, for example, makes glucose just like this doesn't exist. Catalytic activity. It can. It can have. Right. Yeah. Does it happen only for non-coding RNA, or it can also like switch between having a actual enzymatic activity? And so, like the, the example, for example, from bacteria I just described is can be actually coding RNA, but it sits in the non-coding region usually. In the, so in the RNA molecule, you have the coding region. And then what we have is the, it has an end, as a five prime and a three prime end, like it has a left and a right. And basically you have regions which we call the right and the left uncoded, untranslated region, which is not necessarily coding, but this is where a lot of regulatory elements sit. And so, for example, there you could have an event like this where you have an aptamer or a self-cleaving system which can react with a molecule, cleaving itself, and then it leads that this RNA gets degraded or not translated. That's a one possibility. And but generally, um, I think in eukaryotes, there are not so many catalytically active RNAs present in the genome. As, I, as far as I know, there's one in a plant cell, the TPP riboswitch. But in prokaryotes, it's very prevalent. Um, the, reason, like we, the reason how you identify them usually 
is you fig you found one and then you look at the sequence of the RNA. And sometimes there's a structure function relationship and you can predict the structure based on the sequence to a certain extent. And then you use that sequence and you look in other organisms and see is that sequence also present. And then you figure out, okay, they, they also have it. We haven't found them in a classical eukaryote yet. Doesn't mean that it doesn't have it. And you, the, the one thing you said is that of course, why do we have so many junk RNA, right? Non-coding RNA. And maybe there are catalytically active that have, just haven't found them yet. But so far we know about one in eukaryote or two. Yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I was asking uh, for the fact that if they have to code for profit, they will have a defined uh, primary, a, a defined pre sequence that is uh, given by the protein that they have to uh, yeah. code. But at the same time, if they have to have a secondary structure in order to perform whatever task, well, no, there's a, there's of course, right? Like you know, but that is also a possibility for regulation, right? Like you could just say, um, you know, if they have a secondary task, for example, if they're not bound by a ribosome, and we know that, you know, there's a lot of RNA binding proteins to make an RNA linear, so even the ribosome has some force to un you know, to 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 get rid of the structure which has been formed while the ribosome is moving over. And for example, um, secondary structures are used, for example, in, in, in the transcription, in, in stopping the transcription. Um, in bacteria, for example, you form a loop and then the RNA polymerase just gets stuck and then it just falls off eventually. Um, but there are a lot of structures and you can form structures um, you know, when you, when you have RNA binding proteins can force certain structures of your RNA while others can just dissolve them. And we have a lot of these molecules called helicases, which get rid of these structures because sometimes they are harmful because they anyway will, will always form. All right. And this is where we now have genes, right? So there was another question. I think, Stashi, there's one over here. So, um, so it's called transcription when the RNA is created from the DNA. Or is yeah. it called like de decryption when it's read by the ribosome? No, it's translation. Translation, okay. Translation, and exactly. My, you translate my... that message. Yeah. And then my question is, what drives it? Is is there an ATP usage, or is it driven by itself? Or... So basically, first you have your RNA molecule, and then your ribosome is um, which we call the initiation of translation. Um, so basically, your ribosome has three, two big subunits. You have one a lower part, like let's just you know, lower part and a bigger part. And at one point, you want to there's a certain sequence of your on your on your RNA, which brings this ribosome together. Right? But then, what you need to do is you need to charge your tRNA. So there's another RNA molecule, it's the transfer RNA. Right? It transfers the amino acid to the ribosome, which then gets, can get polymerized. So if I go back here, this is this molecule. And if you have your RNA molecule down there, you need to translate this codon into the amino acid. And this is done by a mole like another RNA molecule called the transfer RNA which has the complementary letter on the side to read out this triplet codon, but then has this amino acid covalently bound on top of it. And first, you need to form this bond, this gonna cost you some energy. But then you need to incorporate this RNA molecule in an empty ribosome. And this is where we have initiation factors called e, uh, like initiation factor proteins, which are um, and, um, and GT, what we call the GTPases, which use another nucleotide, not ATP, but GTP, uh, it just has a different base, in order to charge this ribosome with the tRNAs and to make sure that the right tRNA is bound with the right codon. And this is where your energetics come in. And then you have a cycle of these initiation factors which hydrolyze the GTP in order to charge this ribosome. And then you can form, you have two of these next to each other, 
and then the ribosome builds the 3D structure and the chemical environment for these two amino acids to react with each other. And then you have, for example, two amino acids sitting here, and then it moves one step further, one TNI gets kicked out, and the, the whole cycle of this initiation um, um, GTPase puts another TNI. And then you just like move along the arm. Yeah, that would be the short answer. Sorry. <laughs> one ATP, one step. Yeah. But then you need another three for you know putting it in the right place and have the proofreading. So I have read that the amino acids in the cell are not all used for formation of proteins. Is that is true, right? That is true. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so is it that they are just randomly floating around inside the cell, the amino acids? Because in the diagram uh, of the tRNA, the amino acid is it's now bound, the it's bound. But there are also a lot of free pools of amino acids. So is it that the ones that are to be used for protein formation specifically get immediately bound to the respective tRNAs and the rest which are not used for protein formation are randomly floating around? That's a good question. Is, are there free tRNAs in the cell? I don't know if, I don't know, right? Um, I think, are they most, mostly charged or not? Both. It's half-half, right? Yeah, so if you would answer this, because I don't want to, you know, hand wave the argument here. Bit of both. Two-part question. It's actually a two-part question because you said what's happening to all the other amino acids, right? So, of course, a lot of tRNAs are uncharged. The amount of charging is actually an indicator of your um, uh, uh, nutrient sufficiency or energy nutrient, sufficiency, yes. right? So there's a lot of uncharged DNA, tRNA, but more than that, there's a lot more amino acids than what is charged to tRNA. So quantitatively, your amino acids are 10, 100 times more than what you have, the number of tRNAs. The, 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 a, most of the amino acids are actually not used for translation. It's only a small component, maybe 20%. The rest are used for other metabolic functions. And the second part, how is the tRNA charged? There are three, <laughs> three parts to that. Unfortunately, everything has too many parts. Um, one is, uh, so, you know, your, your amino acid concentrations change by about an order of magnitude or more. And your affinity of the tRNA is in that nice sweet spot range. So once you drop below the affinity, the tRNA remains uncharged. It's a, it's a very nice sweet spot where the amino acid concentrations exceed or decrease that uh, the, the, the binding constant of the tRNA. So you have this window where you can go above and below. So that's the kind of short answer. When you deplete subsets of amino acids, and it's again, there are 20 amino acids, not all of them will be used at the same rate and are made at the same rate which means you can have a subset of tRNAs that are more uncharged. And usually that's what's an indicator because a tRNA is specific to an amino acid. It's not the same tRNA binding a different one. So, so you have all of the above, but yeah. that's the... Um, so another follow-up question, yeah. sorry. So there is also a stress response when there's a deficiency of amino acids. So that stress response is amino acid specific or in general, uh, like the total concentration of amino acids have, have to drop below a certain point for the stress response to get activated. Okay. So the um, uh, prokaryotes have a slightly different one. Eukaryotes have a slightly different one. That's the integrated stress response. It doesn't have to deplete all amino acids. Most of the time, your stress response is triggered by what would be the most limiting at that time amino acid. And any one is sufficient. You don't need to have a general starvation. Of course, you also have a general starvation response, which is obvious, but that's kind of sub consequent to any one amino acid being depleted. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Exactly. And then um, the central dogma makes a gene, right? Like in a way that each segment of your DNA. Um, that is transcribed into protein coding mRNA is called a gene. 
And, you know, the expression what we just already talked about, you know, whether you want to express a gene or not, you know, is regulated by a, a protein family called transcription factors, which can be activated and then turn your gene on and turn your gene off. Um, and these usually bind regions in your DNA, which we know as regulatory segments. There are enhancers, um, um, repressors, and so on and so forth. These are usually DNA elements, which are then bound by proteins, which then regulate the magnitude of your transcription. And we had this example already that RNA can also have these regulatory elements. And in a way, um, for example, you know, this is the classical gene regulatory circuit, for example, for the, for the LUC repressor, you have a binding site of proteins, which this is an electron um, image of your DNA segment. You know, I don't know if you can see this here in this, on this, this electron structure here is the DNA segment. And then you have this bright spot sitting on top of it. And that's a, um, a protein bound um, to your regulatory element on your DNA. Um, but basically what this makes you is that life can be also seen as an outer catalytic loop. Right? Outer catal catalysis is if the product of a chemical reaction can catalyze the chemical reaction itself, it was made from. Right? So for example, you can say that, you know, if you think about RNA, RNA can polymerize into, um, you know, an, or like the nucleotides can polymerize into an RNA, which then has catalytical function to make more of it. Classical outer catalytic loop, and that's one idea how maybe life or self-replication has started. But similarly, this RNA could, for example, make a protein, which then helps to make another protein to make itself. For example, there's a lot of proteins on the ribosome where you need proteins and RNA in order to make your protein. So at one point, you can just see that this central dogma is conceptually a very nice autocatalytical loop. Um, and then we have all this beautiful chemistry, but then all living things, in a way, depending how you define it, are made of cells. And these cells are membrane-enclosed units filled with concentrated aqueous solutions of chemicals and endowed with the ability to create copy of themselves. And the field of cell biology is actually the study of the structure, function, and behavior. However, we all know, and that's what we're trying to understand, is that a living cell is a dynamical chemical system operating far from chemical equilibrium. And it must take in energy and matter from the environment. And when the supply of energy and matter stops, and then usually cells decay to equilibrium, and that is when we die. Um, and at one point, free energy then must be used in order to create and maintain the order and propagate the information. And this is where your lipids become really, really important, right? Because you want to extract energy from the environment, you reduce the entropy of the environment, but you also then need to dissipate to the environment. So you have to create an environment in the first place. And this is how we can use you know, our membrane or these lipids because of their chemical features of this um, um, being amphiphatic, so having a hydrophobic tail and um, a phospholipid, like a charged phospholipid. You form these, if you just take a lipid and you throw it in a cell, like you can form this phospholipid bilayers, and this is what your membrane, and usually this is what is surrounding the cell. And these plasma membranes act as a selective barrier and enables, for example, also cells to concentrate um, nutrients and retain their products. These membranes are formed by lipids, and they assemble in these, or self-assemble into these bilayers. Um, and these membranes allow cells to exchange energy and matter with the environment. Um, and if we now look at what kind of cells they are, right? For example, this is a prokaryote. And this is depicted of a cell which we all know really well. This is Escherichia coli, or like a schematic of Escherichia coli, and that's defined as a prokaryote. And you know, Escherichia coli has um, 
as a, an outer membrane, and usually cells are classified by their structure. And this has historical reasons, right? Because we just started to look at them before we knew anything about it with microscopes, right? Like, and then living cells are based on their cell structure into eukaryotes and prokaryotes, and they also are archaea. And then most prokaryotes are made of, like, you know, are small and simple in appearance. So for example, E. coli is roughly um, a micrometer um, in, in, in diameter and in length a little bit longer. I think it's a femtoliter. It's a, cu it's a cubic micrometer in volume. It's a femtoliter. Um, you know, it has a has an outer membrane, a cell wall, and an inner membrane, DNA, which is organized in, in nucleotides, and then a lot of ribosomes. If you just look at an electron microscope, you would see ribosomes right inside an E. coli cell. And then it has a flagellum, which is then the machinery which is used for the E. coli to move. Um, and then most of them live in individuals or in loosely organized communities. I, I don't know if you have heard, ever heard about biofilms. These are the communities of prokaryotes, and they're extremely diverse, far more diverse than eukaryotes. And they can virtually use any type of food. What do I mean by food is there is this classical way um, how we define what kind of food an organism eats. And there's something which is a mouthful is organotrophic. Right, so the trophy from Greek means food, and it means that organotrophic organisms feed on organic chemicals, for example, your glucose or your amino acid or your lipids. However, of course, there are also photosynthetic organisms like algae and plants, which are phototrophic, which use or transform the energy of the sun, and that's kind of their um, food for energy. And then there are organisms which are lithotrophic, and lithotrophic means they feed on rock, right? So they can literally eat iron or something else. And um, this is usually present in the prokaryotic kingdom. Um, there's an order to E. coli, right? Like Escherichia coli has been one of the, fir of the first model um, system in molecular biology. Um, and there's decades of research just on a single organism called E. coli. Um, there's a lot of information available on E. coli, especially like if you want to, you know, if if you want to understand what's going on, you're probably going to find the information in E. coli, and it's kind of you you can use E. coli as a standard ruler, right? Like you know, you can, for example, define you know how heavy is an E. coli, and then compare that to another cell and say, okay, my eukaryotic cell has ten E. coli. Um, but how can we, you, for example, get the mass of an E. coli? Cell? So how do you know an E. coli cell is a picogram, right? So one of the current state of the art things to measure the mass of cells is to measure its buoyant, buoyant mass. So basically what you can do is you can have this micro resonator, which just like resonates all the time and you have this tiny little channel and you can flow media of different, um, different um, um, viscosities in there and you can use microfluidics to put your E. coli in here, you resonate it and then you can get the buoyant mass out of it. And if you do this as a function of the growth rate of your E. coli culture, you can see is that you can measure the buoyant mass as a function of the growth rate. And you can now see that, you know, faster growing cells have a lot, like have, are heavier. Right? And this is where exponential um, growth comes in, in one sense. And this also means they have a lot of more ribosomes. And so you can now, for example, deduct the dry mass of an E. coli cell as a function of growth. Um, and then we know a lot about the numerology of an E. coli cell, right? Like I, in the beginning, I showed you what it is made of. And so now you can go and look at the information. And so, for example, think about an E. coli cell, how much protein is there? And I told you roughly in the beginning, it's about um, um, 2 million. You can see what is the length of the genome, how many ribosomes there are, how many molecules of RNA are in an E. coli how much um, ions are in there, how much lipids does an E. coli have, how much water, and how much membrane. So this is all information which is out there, which can then really help us to make estimates about biological processes or, for example, energetic cost. If you want to make two of this, you have to make all this from the environment. Um, and then you can start to compare these numbers from an E. coli cell. So, right, like, you know, the rule of thumb is roughly a cubic micron, a picogram, or a femtoliter, 
the surface area, you have all these numbers, and now you can start to compare with two others. And for example, here you can see a yeast cell is, is much bigger, is heavier, um, has a larger cell cycle time. How am I doing with time? 10 minutes? Um, and then a rule, another rule of thumb is the concentration of one nanomolar of your molecule is roughly one molecule in one E. coli. So, you know, and then, of, of course, you know, 10 nanomoles is 10 molecules. Of e. coli. So, for example, if your metabolite or your amino acid is one nanomolar, you know that E. coli has one molecule. Um, and similarly, you can then say, okay, you know, in a, in a diameter of roughly, you know, a micron, the concentration of one nanomolar is one molecule. But if I now want to know right now, right now in, a, in a diameter of 50 nanometers, roughly one molecule gives rise to a concentration. It's just like this is the one molecule um, line. Um, and then, you know, you can use E. coli as a standard ruler, and you can now compare the size of an E. coli, what you know about the amount of protein, so on and so forth, to other cellular structures. For example, like a viral capsid or a DNA, or if you think about E. coli to a classical um, epithelial cell, you can see there's a, a tenfold difference in sizes to an epithelium to even a whole tissue. It's just handy to have something like a ruler in hand in order to make certain estimates of size comparison. And since we know so much about it, of course, there's also fundamental differences to, between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, which I think I can come um, in a minute, for example, these are all eukaryotic cells, and this is an E. coli down here, and you can just like see the size distribution of the size comparisons. So this is the red blood cell, which transports your oxygen in your blood, and you can see the size comparison. And here, you, for example, we have a neuron, a neuron, of course, with an axon and your dendrites, classical information processing unit in your brain, and it's much, much bigger than an E. coli. This is an epithelial cell. This is your little E. coli, and that's your photoreceptors in your eyes, just as a, as a side. But then, this is a prokaryote, and now if we start to make, have a look at a eukaryote, a classical mammalian cell, you can see that there's much more going on inside um, the cell. Right? You start to now have organelles, and a eukaryotic cell is much bigger, right? 10 to 1,000 fold much bigger, and they have much, they are much more elaborate in a way than prokaryotes. And of course, they have intracellular structures, which we call organelles. They, intracellular structures can be membrane-bound or non-membrane-bound structures. And the, the biggest characteristic which makes them different is that they have an organelle called the nucleus. And in the nucleus, of course, is where all your DNA is localized and where your DNA replication transcriptions happen. And many eukaryotes live a solitary life. Some of them are hunters. We have Protea zones, which like to eat other small little, um, small little um, eukaryotes. And I don't know if you have ever seen a video, for example, of a stentor eating another prokaryote. It's actually very brutal, right? Like, you know, you have, you know, you, they put a stinger in it and then just like the whole cell explodes and it gets eaten. Um, and then some of them are actually um, um, do photosynthesis. So we have algae, which are eukaryotes which can, can harness the light. And then some of them are scavengers and use the funding such as eating on rotten fruit, and so on. Um, if we now think about a eukaryotic cell, right, like we have, a, we have a nucleus, and then we have something around it. It's a membrane structure called the endoplasmatic reticulum. This is where a lot of proteins get processed for putting it on the membrane or excreting it to the environment. We have um, you know, cytoskeleton elements to transport things in our cells, to have cells move, to generate forces and so on and so forth. And that's just a size comparison between an E. coli and a classical yeast, they're much bigger. Um, and we can also, what we also know is we can also measure, as I told you, we can measure the size of an E. coli, but we can also measure, for example, the volume occupied by a yeast cell, or even if it's mass, and you can see this is the distribution of the volume occupied by a yeast cell, and it's, you can see that they are roughly about 30, 30 femtoliters in size, and a, Classical um, mammalian cell is roughly about a thousand femtoliters. Um, 
We talked about this, and in another way, for example, to measure mass of cells is a technique which we, for example, use in the lab, which is quantitative phase microscopy. And the principle is basically you have a white light source which you pass through a reference and your sample. And eventually you, you put these, light so like these, these lights together and let them interfere with each other. And then what you're gonna get from that is a hologram or interference pattern of these two light sources. Um, and that is related, gives you the phase of the light which is related to the refractive index um, of, of your sample. And then from that sample, you can then calculate the refractive index, which you then need, use to calculate the mass per pixel, which you then can sum up and then gives you the mass distribution of your cell. Um, and it works really well. I think you, we, we tried it with E. coli and so on and so forth. And it's apparently um, a standard technique for, for small, like um, thin little samples. The problem is that it doesn't work. For example, if you want to put an embryo in there, it's too thick. There are other techniques out there, which is optical diffraction tomography, which you can also measure the fractive index in 3D. And then from that, you can then get your mass of your cell or mass accumulation. Of your cell. Um, and if we now look at, of course, you know, you have we have tissues, we have all different cell types, and you can already see that we have a huge like diversity in cell sizes in the human body. And the largest cell is usually your oocyte or your germ cell. Um, we also can start now to put numbers on, you know, not only in E. coli, but also in, in yeast and in other eukaryotic systems. It always then, of course, depends on your cell type you're looking at. But a yeast cell, we can also now start to compare numbers and concentrations of these molecules um, between um, yeast and mammalians as well as in E. coli. Um, for example, then you can also start to ask, you know, how big are our intracellular um, intracellular um, structures, for example, the nucleus, and then this is classically done from microscopy images. So, for example, you can take an electron micrograph, so you may use an electron microscope and then measure the diameter of the nucleus or a fluorescent image, and then you can, for example, plot the average cell area against the nuclear area, and you can see that they seem to be proportional. Um, however, if you do this over many different cell types, you can see that there is a proportionality arising that usually you can use the nuclear area or the nuclear size as a proxy for cell size. And normally, if you just look at this, it's probably about, you know, um, two, two to the tenth of your cellular volume. Um, so this is what traditionally sometimes people also use, is they use the scaling regime across different cell types in order to not measure the whole cell, but just to measure the nucleus, which is technically much easier, and then deduct the cell volume from it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, of course, it's a very, very rough estimate of like tissue culture size, right? Um, so generally it has no geom geom like very little geometry information in there where like people just segmented the cells, see what kind of nucleus, like how big it, it is and measure the nucleus. And of course, um, that only is true in systems where your nuclear size scales with your cell. So for example, if you think about early embryogenesis, that may or may not be true for your system you're looking at. Um, and of course it has no information of geometry and you're probably going to find a cell type which is not going to follow the scaling. I hope that answers your question. And then you can you can do the same thing for you know like your intracellular structures, and people have done this classically from electron micrographs, and we have actually a pretty good understanding of depending on in certain cell types, it's like how much of your cell membrane is actually outer membrane versus inner membrane and what are the percentages. And you might be surprised is that the plasma membrane, for example, in a liver cell or in a pancreatic cell, is only less than 10% of your total membrane a cell has. Right? So most of your membrane surface area is actually intracellular. Um, so for example, in, in the pancreatic, which excretes a lot of things into your 
into the environment, a lot of thing is endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria also um, to um, have a substantial. And I think I'm just gonna finish on how big are the mitochondria. Oh, maybe I'll, I'll start there over, over again, but like mitochondria also the question is, Saying how big a mitochondria is is hard because a single mitochondria in my mind doesn't exist and only under very specific conditions because mitochondria are actually a network. Right? So you have this classical view of a mitochondria because this comes from if you cut a tube in half and you look from the top, it looks like a round little thing. But basically, usually mitochondria are this organized network. And this is roughly like have a like a diameter of roughly one micron. And under certain conditions, they can be this classical spherical single mitochondria, but this is very, very rare, which you see in textbook. Normally mitochondria are a network organized like this. And then of course, you always ask this question, or like it's this question arises, to what extent is this mitochondrial network structure related to its function and how well it makes ATP or how well it provides other energetic molecules or the cells such as amino acids or precursors. And there's this, it's still a debate in my mind what the structure function relationship is of this mitochondrial network with this function. Um, and we have ranges of cell sizes as well as a ranges of cell morphologies in the human body. And I think I'm gonna just stop here for today and then continue tomorrow. Thank you very much. And if you have more questions, of course, there's plenty of time. So I had a question about these mitochondrial networks. Mm -hmm. So are they like um, Can you speak, to... speak up a little bit or hold the microphone closer? Um, yeah. So these mitochondrial networks, are they like attached to microtubules or do, do they kind of, um, are, do they form the network themselves? Like it's just them. So they, they are, they are interactions between the endoplasmatic reticulum and the mitochondrial network. There is um, proteins which bridge the mitochondria with the microtubules. So they also, for example, in your neurons, they are transported on the microtubules. For example, during cell division, there is transport of mitochondria on your microtubule network interactions. And I think it can also interact with actin. And if you destroy this interaction, sometimes the network breaks down. Thank you. All right, are there any more questions? Otherwise, all right. Thank you. So uh, in the interference-based method to uh, measure mass, yeah. you assume that the refractive index is proportional to the mass? Yeah. So, but that might not always be true, right? Um, so uh, based on the granularity of the cytoplasm, the RI might change, right? The RA will change in the cytoplasm. So for example, if you look at this images, for example, um, so here, this is an intent, well, like it's the R, like the, the intensity, that's the phase image. And you can already see that, for example, the nucleoli, there's a, this is a non-membrane bound compartment in your nucleus is much denser. But uh, one is a mass-based uh, property and the other is a optical property. It's an optical property, but there is a relationship. Like I'm not the the I haven't developed the method, but as I, as far as I understood, you can use the RA like the optical inferred RA in order to calculate the mass in the pixel. Thank you. But I can I, I'll get the information. I'll send I'll get the paper and then I'll, you can I can I'm happy to share it. I have it. So when you say that ATP is the energy currency, one, yeah, one, of, one, the one of the energy currencies, um, and I'm asking because I don't really know, uh, do, you, do you mean um, energy, free energy, or negative entropy, and what, how are those things related? So as a biochemist, we, we think about free energy, right? It gives free energy um, in a way, and you get roughly you know, the delta G0 at equilibrium, you get about 40 kilojoules per mole. What is that in KT? Um, I think 12, 25 KT. The ATP hydrolysis, 25 KT. Right. 20. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a huge number. It's obviously not right. But it's no, it's, of course, you have a constant. You have a constant. It also depends on the environment, right? But if we think about energy, and usually it's free energy. 
that this will be think. And then, you know, if you have a delta G change of a reaction, for example, you have a negative free energy change, for example, and that would you all, you know, that is also dissipated to the environment. Or it can be used for other, if it's coupled to another reactor. What's the difference between free energy and entropy? I, I just don't really know. At constant temperature, it's, you know, like, it's, you can assume that it's similar. Energy yeah. TS, right. Master Villano will tell you all about the, the, the physics of it. Question, uh, why do cells prefer ATP more than CTPs or TTPs or GTPs? I don't know. That's the conundrum why ATP has been selected as, well, there are, there are also, it's the majority. that It's not true that they don't use CTP or GTP. Okay. But they use majority use ATP, but of course during lipid metabolism you use sometimes CTP. Okay. And then a lot of proteins which we know as GTP aces, which are usually regulatory proteins, they use GTP as an as a driving, um, but the majority use ATP. Why that is, I don't know. Okay. Thank you. And of course, ATP is only one currency, is there more? Right, thank you.